You've probably figured out now, by the name of my channel, that I really like Alco diesel locomotives. Now that said, I wasn't always like this. There was a time, especially when I was much younger, that I always wanted a steam locomotive. Specifically, this particular steam locomotive, the Bachmann 440 American. I particularly always liked this engine, the way the drive wheels looked, the style, the brass. There was just something about it that really attracted me to it. And ironically enough, I just couldn't get one because, well, none of the stores around my area ever had this particular engine available. While I never was successful in acquiring a 440 American, I was successful in getting one of these in the early 90s for Christmas, this very type engine, which is an 040 tank steam switcher. I would later get these in the 90s as they became available with the Toys R Us Express train set. I would get a few of these when I was a kid as I had now cash from my allowance and these sets were cheap, but that was basically the end of my collection of steam engines with one exception. I did receive a larger IHC locomotive somewhere in the mid-90s, for Christmas. Unfortunately, that engine, well, typical IHC quality of the time at least, deteriorated very quickly, and of course, to be honest, a trip to the concrete floor didn't help it. After having so many mechanical failures, I vowed to give up on steam and just go diesel full blast. Then, in more recent times, something strange happened as I was trying to get locomotives as we see by the one I am working on here, together for the Bachman documentary, I discovered this particular locomotive, the 440 American again, and realized and remembered how much I loved it. With that, my interest in getting one of these engines was strongly rekindled, and I began to search high and low for a better example, as this one with the pancake drive from what I have seen is pretty bad. So anyway, browsing around eBay, I happened to come across this particular set called the General. And yes, it actually utilizes a Bachmann 440 American type locomotive as its power. I found this stupid cheap online and decided to go give it a whirl and finally get one of my dream locomotives acquired. The name General is by no means an accident. The set is named after the train that the Union Army undercover group stole to invade into southern lines and essentially wreck the southern railroads during the Civil War in an effort to, in an effort to bring that war to an end sooner. For a good representation of this, if you're interested, I'd recommend checking out the Disney film The Great Locomotive Chase, which does a pretty good job of getting the main facts on screen pretty well, although there are a few inaccuracies with it. If you look at the box, we again see that there is a 440 American in there, as well as a gondola, old-time gondola car, an old-time box car, and yes, an old-time coach. We also see the replica representation of an old telegraph office. I must also note again that this train set is only designed, as we see from the note on the top there, for people 14 years and older, so please keep that in mind. So please keep this fact in mind if you're looking to buy this set for a younger person and as you view this video. With that out of the way, let's take a look at the back of the box. As we can see, we get the usual Bachman propaganda over what's included with the set, and a brief story on the history of the train that this set models. We also note that the track included with the set is enough to make a 56 by 38 inch oval. That's noticeably larger than most Bachman sets, as a lot of the even higher than entry level sets just include all curves and no straight sections. Anyway, background over, let's go ahead and open her up and see what she's got. Now, I must reiterate again, this is an internet bargain find for myself. I paid nowhere near the full price. And if I had to give you a rough idea, I paid less than the price of the locomotive for the whole set. As we'll see, this cheap price came with a lot of strings attached. To start with, as we note, the box has been very heavily taped shut. I'm not sure why this was necessary, but it unfortunately wound up damaging this box. Needless to say, I'm okay with this, as this set was clearly not in collectible condition. As we take our first look inside, we see it's the usual Bachman 2 box arrangement. The white box containing all the rolling stock, and the brown box containing the tracks and or accessories, or in this case, what's left of them. I'll go over that in a second. Well, let's take a look at the rolling stock up in front, and we can start to immediately see that, well, <laughs> things aren't all as they should be. To start with, you'll note that there is this massive wide space on the side right there. That is where the telegraph office was supposed to be located. Unfortunately, well, <laughs> it wasn't included as part of the set. Uh, did I mention this was a bargain? Oh yeah, that's right. I did mention that several times. So, well, yeah. Something I had to give, and that's what gave. I'll try to keep my mouth closed about what a bargain I got on this, as I'm sure it's driving most of you up the wall. We also note that the plastic packaging, which all the rolling stock is stored in, is literally cover covered with what appears to be cling film or Reynolds wrap. It's not clear as to why this was necessary, but, well, the previous owner slash liquidator thought it was. Yeah. Anywho, let's take a good look at what I have been dreaming about for several years, the <laughs> 440 American. I love the way the black contrasts with the lettering as well as the whistles and all the other detailing on this locomotive. It really sets it off. It looks, makes it look really slick, in my opinion. 
I can't help but marvel at the little gold inlays and other such detailing. I must also point out that despite all of the wonderfulness of this engine, it is built down to a price. It is tender-driven, meaning the motor is mounted in the tender. Also, the motor itself is a mere three poles, not five, making it even rougher in terms of its operations. Although there are, again, a lot of nice little pieces, including the little brass bars, which are apparently out of position there. The cow catcher, as we call that in America, which is that red assembly on the base, is in place. The nose and the headlamp, the number three, is very prominently displayed. All of it's done very well, and the smokestack, as we saw from the overhead shots, even has the proper filtering on it. I must, however, note that the locomotive does not feature a coil-sprung coupler, and instead makes do with the cheap ABS-style sprung coupler which is not my favorite type as they tend to fail over time. Over here we have the box car, which again is opening doors. Also note the brake wheel on the top of the car. Now this is fully realistic as this was, well, the only way to apply the brakes from this era of equipment. The brakemen had to walk on the roofs and turn them. Another nice detail are these truss rods underneath the car, which actually support the frame. Also, no yet again, note the plastic sprung couplers, which are actually inaccurate for this era of this train set, as the real-life trains would have used these, used the Lincoln pin style, which was which is still utilized to in a variation to this day in the UK. In the US, it was outlawed due to a severe accident that occurred on the line. Nonetheless, this is a very well done car. Now let's move on to the gondola mm. car. Again, it's an old-time style car. It has the brake wheel noted on the top, and that's because the brake men actually used to have to walk across the roofs or tops of the cars to apply them. We also see that it has truss rods underneath it, which again support and hold the structure of the car together. We also note again it utilizes the annoying plastic leaf-sprung couplers. As I, men I mentioned that once, I'll say it again, so there's no need to go into more detail on that. And the car yet again uses plastic wheels, much like the rest of the set. And last but not least, the old-time coach that was utilized in this set, which I believe was used in the real train, too. It's a combine coach, meaning it's a cross between freight and passengers, mostly luggage. In reality, there isn't much to look at here. It's a standard old-time coach from Bachmann's line, just with a different paint scheme on it. Again, using the truss rods, very nicely replicated, I might add, from the base. Plastic wheels, and again, the infamous plastic sprung couplers. This is, of course, the revised one from the mid-2000s when Bachman, I believe, retooled these. The main differences can't be seen as it basically relates to the way the weights were attached and some minor detailing on the railings as well as slightly better looking upper windows in these coaches. We also note the box contains the usual instructions as well as promotional materials for buying extended track sets as well as basic safety instructions and a warranty statement of this particular train set. Again, note that the warranty statement does not go for lifetime of this set. It goes for 30 days. And this is also from the date of manufacture, which is noted up there on the top, which I believe it stated it's 2003. And without further ado, let's move on to setting up the actual tracks, which are in fact a steel alloy. Now, again, the loop on this set, I should mention, is a little bit bigger than the sets I usually have gotten. It has two straight sections in the center section. To make up its 56 by 38 inch oval, Assembly, however, is exactly the same. We align the two sections together, making sure the fish plates are aligned correctly, and then gently push them together, checking carefully to make sure that the connections are made smoothly as to avoid a major derailment, as well as any potential power problems and or erratic running from the set itself. As I continue to assemble the track, I'm just going to quickly point out that the set did not include everything, as I mentioned before, and that included a lot of the tracks. And to be honest, I really didn't mind. As since I've reviewed a few of these train sets now, I have the tracks simply laying around. And after all, again, it was a bargain. Oh! Anyway, with all the tracks together, it's now time to connect the track power wire. This is a pretty simple procedure, which I will go over again. Simply insert the plug right into the actual re-railer itself, apply pressure until it snaps into position. It does take a little oomph to do this, so don't be afraid to be a little bit more firm with it than normal. And then we'll connect the other end to the two-track socket on the actual speed controller. And, of course, finally, we'll connect the power pack to the power pack socket on the back of the speed controller. I should also quickly point out that the power pack slash speed controller was not included, but again, I had one handy because I reviewed these train sets, and after all, the set was a bargain. Oh! I did it again! Anyway, let's go ahead and try to get our locomotive on the tracks, and as we can see, it was, well, less than happy to jump on them. After a little messing around, it became very clear that the trucks themselves were a little bit worse for wear. To start with, we can see that one of the trucks was rotated roughly an extra 30 degrees, I want to say, and the pickups were, and or mm. wheel wipers were in pretty not so great shape in terms of their positioning. Luckily, this isn't too difficult a, difficult a problem to solve. All we need is a uh, Phillips head screwdriver and some patience. Again, the majority of the power comes through these two pickups on the tender itself, so it is very critical that these pickups are in the right position.
After turning the screwdriver counterclockwise, I'm able to loosen the trucks up enough to get the pickups to be maneuverable, and once this is done, I was able to snug them back into position. I must also note, and another sign of the limited quality of this set, is that if the screws are tightened too tightly, the trucks will not turn, so you need to back them off a little bit. It just shows you how crude this model really is, despite its great looks on the outside. Again, that's typical Bachman for you. With that problem solved, I was able to get the locomotive on the track, and I decided before going any further, I should find out how well, or even if, my bargain basement set would actually run before I actually gave my opinion on it. Oh, I said it again! As we can see, this hmm. locomotive was, to put it mildly, a timid runner to start with. Not a good sign for a review. This is mainly due to the cheap motor underneath the hood, which I will go into more detail toward the end of this video. Initial operations were very jerky and unrefined. I'm just glad I'm not having this locomotive appraised for some stupid amount of money, not that it ever would be worth that much. After a few run-in sessions, the locomotive finally began to behave the way it was supposed to, although it still was very rough finding every chance it could to stall out on me. With the running problems at least somewhat handled, it was time to start re-railing the cars and get them set up to actually run. Again, the procedure is the same. We place the car roughly on the track, pull it back and forth along the re-railer until it falls into place with a satisfying click. That's how we know we're on the track. Once on the track, we simply press the car against the locomotive and the couplers will engage automatically. We repeat this procedure for the remaining cars <coughs> in the set to get them all set to run. And with everything on track and all connected and coupled together, it is time to give her a whirl and see exactly how well she runs. I guess I should have said if she runs. At this point, my bargain basement was looking to be not so much a, well, bargain. Oh, again! <laughs> anyway, a small little push got the engine running, but as you can see, she was kind of timid and not so happy. After a little more consistent running, the locomotive finally began to behave better, seemingly exercises what this unit needed. I can only guess how long it's been out of service, or if it even entered service at all. I have to wonder if someone didn't just buy this set and essentially t take possession of the telegraph office thing, and basically put the rest back in the box, hoping to get whatever money they could. The locomotive sounded buzzy and just plain unhappy through its whole test. Unfortunately, that wasn't the only problem I would run into, as we'll soon see. Uh, did I mention I don't like these plastic ABS sprung couplers? Well, yeah, now you know why. Admittedly, too, as we can hear, there's a little clicking going on, which indicates the train did come off the track, and yes, one of these track sections was, in fact, misaligned, due to a bent rail joiner. One of the hazards of buying a used set and or a train that was a bargain like this one. Oh, I did it again! The locomotive itself seemed to bob and wobble its way around the track. Again, as, again, this is sort of a symptom of the rather cheap build quality these engines suffered from. Well, that's enough of mainline running at speed. Let's see how this locomotive does in a crawl test. And please note this engine had mileage on it before I did its run-in, which was very thorough. As we can see, this locomotive is clearly a reluctant crawler. This is as slow as I could get it to go, and as you see, I also had to give it a push occasionally. Speed was inconsistent, mainly due to the three-pole motor and the sort of archaic and somewhat crude drive system, which was anything but refined. Thank you. 
And yes, the locomotive did surge and run quicker in reverse than it did in forward, with the same throttle settings. Anywho, after messing around with the throttle and making several attempts to get the engine to crawl, it became very clear that the engine just wasn't going to be able to. And even when I was successful in getting the locomotive to run slowly, it had a tendency to stall and or surge for no apparent reason at all. In terms of high speed performance, this set suffered from the exact opposite problem. The engine runs far, far too fast in scale for this particular model. Mind you, back in the days these engines ran, 40 miles per hour was considered pretty quick, and 55 to 65, that was, well, <laughs> pretty much light speed. And that'll just about do it for the running and performance section of this review. Let's go ahead and take a look under the hood and see what makes this baby tick. Despite being noticeably younger than the original pancake motor propelled 440 American that I showed at the beginning of this video, the drivetrain is very, very similar. The front truck powers only the headlamp and provides an extra ground for the locomotive, but is not a true pickup in itself. Again, as I mentioned before, the power comes through the two rear trucks. One truck takes positive, the other truck takes negative, meaning the locomotive essentially lacks true all-wheel pickup, and this most definitely contributed to its less-than-stellar performance during the testing phase of this review. This was most definitely further aggravated by the cheap wheel wipers that Bachman employed to pick up power from the axles, which they accomplished by simply dragging along on the axle frames themselves. To get access to the motor itself, we're going to remove the screws in the tender, which will allow us to take the tender top off and view the astonishing three-pole motor. Though I'm not sure exactly what to call it astonishing for. I guess astonishingly terrible would be a better way of describing it. We have to admit the performance wasn't exactly anything great. Once all four screws are removed, the two bigger ones in the front and two smaller ones in the back, the top of the tender simply comes off. As we remove the tender top, we quickly see that this locomotive has more than a passing resemblance to its 1980s predecessor. And there it is in all of its glory, I guess you can say. A three-pole motor, in a very unusual shape, I might add, connected, as you see, with a drive shaft to the rest of the locomotive. And yes, as you can see, I did count the poles, rotating it over very carefully to make sure there were three of them. And I was correct in that there were, in fact, three, though it's hard not to come to that conclusion considering the low-speed performance this engine possesses, which wasn't anything great. We again notice there are only two pickups actually going to the motor, one from the front truck and one from the back truck. And here's a good shot of the drive shaft and coupling assembly that actually drive the locomotive. The shaft again protrudes into the locomotive itself, which hooks in directly into a worm gear, which in turn drives the gear shaft and makes the wheels rotate. We also see that ground connection I was talking about earlier. This provides a little bit extra negative per current, but there is no positive input to back it up. And so therefore the engine is very sensitive to drops in voltage and weak points in the track, further aggravated by the three-pole motor. And as I, through the magic of video editing, do a quick reassembly of this locomotive, it's time for me to give my final thoughts on this particular train set and final opinion. In addition to model rarities, it appears that Bachman made this set to appeal to several different markets. These include the history buffs and the Civil War buffs. Both markets should not be underestimated, as there are known collectors that are willing to spend a lot of money to get a piece of history. And that, I guess, is where this massive price comes in. Now, yeah, I know it's kind of hard to see from here, but wait for it. <laughs> And yes, unfortunately, you weren't seeing things. This set was priced to sell at $299. Possibly for the reasons I mentioned before. Possibly for Bachman again trying to get every last cent out of it. Whatever the case, that's the price it was set for. 
What's unfortunate is this set really doesn't offer much of anything for value for money. The locomotive in particular has a very poor drivetrain. The cars are again equipped with plastic wheels and plastic knuckle couplers with plastic springs. Final cost cutting and dignity this train set was unfortunately forced to endure was the um, was the utilization of the steel alloy tracks instead of nickel silver tracks. It really isn't acceptable to have something that cheap in a set of this price. The only real things you seem to get for your extra money spent are two extra sections of, again, steel alloy track and the apparent limited edition telegraph office replica thing that also doubles as a station that is included as part of the set. Those of you paying careful attention will note that I use the past tense, and this wasn't a mistake. This set has been cancelled as of 2020. While it's not clear why Bachman cancelled the set, there are several reasons that would make perfect sense. Of course, the Civil War being one of them, as that's become a very touchy subject as of late. But the main one, I think, is the fact that the tooling for this locomotive, introduced about 20 years ago, was itself a knockoff of the 1980s tooling, was has now finally been replaced with a much more superior tooling from what I've heard. I haven't gotten one of those in yet to test out, but I will be doing a review on one of those eventually. One of those locomotives full retail price DCC ready comes close to over half the price of what this set was selling for, so it's not hard to understand why Bachman pulled the plug. Bottom line, I'm not very impressed with this set at all. The quality is terrible. It essentially is a blatant attempt to appeal to those who would collect Civil War memorabilia and or into history and or might just want a uh, nice little old steam engine to run around as a model and assume that because of the higher price, they're getting a lot of bang for their buck with a high quality model, which they're not. Bottom line, if you're looking for value, avoid this thing because you're not going to find it here. That said, if you are really into history and or you really would like one of these sets, you better hurry. Although well, the good news is, because these sets are being liquidated out, I've seen them for as little as $186 brand new. Of course, needless to say, I didn't pay anywhere near that much because, again, I got a bargain. Oh, flabber winkies. And that's going to do it for this review. If you liked my review, thumbs up. If not, thumbs down. Like and don't forget to subscribe. And again, as always, keep the metal side, which is your wheels, down on the track. See you next time.